number one, welcome. Uh, it's Skipper's Landing, remembering Skipper's Landing. And uh, uh, we, we, it, a lot of wonderful memories. Anyway, it's a great story that affected many of us. And looking around, um, how many people here like worked at Skipper's Landing? Okay, yeah. Um, we'll expect some, some comments. Um, anyway, there, there's, there's a, a... Okay, wonderful cast, many stories. Uh, I'm going to start out, and then uh, George Byam, uh, and, well, actually George and I are going to start out, and we're going to tell different stories uh, about whatever, whatever. Dan Yates is here, Lee Holly is here, who's a good friend of Harriet Stella. Um, Mike Pillinger is having a foot-ankle operation. Anyway, at this point in time, I'd like to introduce Dan McCormick. So, Dan, come on up front. And uh, the hosts basically are Jerry Gill and Dan McCormick. They are the new owners managers of uh, what's become of Skipper's Landing. I, I worked here um, from 84 to 88. I think a lot of people had summer jobs here. Um, fond memories of this building. Obviously, you can see that we, uh, we didn't do it, but uh, Bruce did it in the mid-80s when we had that last high water. Uh, well, second to last, there was uh, 96 and 97, and then 80, 85, 86, 87, it was coming up. So you can see how much it's raised up, but, uh, you know, I lived in a camper halfway up the driveway. Roger and Jim Logie, they live probably up here in the rafters somewhere. And, you know, we all have our fun stories about this, but it's a great place to be, and I'm happy to continue the uh, tradition. Very fortunate that the Gills purchased the marina and happy to help you guys in any way we can with your summer fun. So thanks. Okay. Hey, is Jerry get to Jerry Gill on here coming? Oh, okay. Jerry's not here. Okay. Um, yeah, Jerry Gill, they're, they're an old family. Uh, Silver Beach been around a long time kind of thing. Um, anyway, thanks, Dan. Um, I hope I'm not too loud. Um, it, you know, but it, it's also it, it, the Harry and Stella. You have to say you can't say Harry because Harry couldn't have done it without Stella, and uh, they were an incredible team, and obviously influenced a lot of our lives. And um, and so, like the first building is, is the shack. The shack was halfway up the hill. You'll see it in some of the photographs. It was a, like a plank and a dock, and and then the white shack. And then slowly, the concrete block building happened down there. It was. You, to get to that building, you went down rather than coming down. This was the high building. And so, uh, you know, this is a story that basically has taken on high water, it's taken on low water, uh, it's taken on good times, bad times, that sort of thing. Anyway, so the second concrete uh, block storage building was built, this one, and then the three bedroom house was built over the first storage building. Um, and then, uh, the, the, over this roof, they built the other display bed room upstairs, and then ultimately uh, the Skipper's Landing retail store on top. You know, and as I was writing this up and I was thinking about, you know, like all that construction and all that on one property, I was thinking, can you imagine dealing with the Fruitland Township planning department today? <laughs> I mean, how many off street parking places are required? How many this, how many of that, you know? And uh, it seems like you go, you go to a meeting at Fruitland Township and everything, with the Sea Club, Sylvan, Michelinda, everything is like a legal non-conforming use, all right? Uh, because the standards have been changed. Anyway, the other thing is that, you know, I, I was trying to explain that. When they built these houses, these buildings, there was no road down here. And so, like, I don't know, really, I wasn't here during construction time, but, like, how did they get all these concrete blocks down the hill? You know, amazing. Somebody says they know. Yeah. yeah, okay, well, but Jim, you, we're going to get to you later on, all right? Um, yeah, actually, what, what, we're going to kind of run through some overview, and then we're going to ask for different people to participate and add whatever uh, what they think we forgot. So, you know, look at the photo panels, and you'll see kind of what, what it's done. And then um, that this is just Skipper's number one. Then there was Skipper's number two, which is built in Montague, which is now next to the Dog and Suds, the kayak place. And then Skipper's number three was started, and that's now Whitehall Landing. So it, it's an amazing story of accomplishment. And it was sort of based on two beliefs. If you read the handout, Fran Schottenberg did a wonderful interview with Harry. And I looked at the dates, and basically it was 20 years ago. So we're dusting off Harry and Stella 20 years later. And um, great story. But anyway, uh, 
You know, following World War II, America was very prosperous, and then Harry always had a love affair with White Lake, as it mentioned in the article. And so his, his, his response was that, you know, like, everyone should get out there and enjoy the water, and that somehow he managed to get, you know, in, instead of having to be Mr. Rich with Mr. 60-foot Chris Pratt, whatever, whatever, or, you know, uh, Matthews, whatever, um, you could then somehow have a boat, you could water ski, you could sell Evan Boone Motors. Harry kind of judged the market, and I always remember that there was a story that he was a very good friend of Adolph Anderson at the Montague Bank, and somehow he would go to see him during the winter time, and that somehow he just hoped by the following fall all that inventory was sold because basically he owed the bank the money kind of thing. Anyway, it worked out rather well. So it's going to, I'm going to give a little of my personal story, and then somehow George will continue with his, but and, and then we'll go into some other ones. But. Um, I started working here when I was 15 years old. You were in high school, right? And uh, and you sort of wonder, you know, like, what are you going to do with a teenage boy who knows everything, and uh, you know, your parents can't really quite deal with you. And so what they did was that basically, uh, we came down here. I came down here at age 15. We lived here. And uh, we lived in the shack, and there's some pictures. There's a picture of me in the upper bunk in the shack. Roger Spielman was another one. Doug Bynum was another one. We lived in the white shack. And, um, and you know, that white shack was moved from like lower on the waterfront up halfway up the hill. And so um, the people who lived here, I mean, it, 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 all of a sudden it was like you were part of a family. And, um, and there was Harry, Stella, Mike, Candy hadn't been born yet, Al Bernard, Lila, Marilyn Brown, um, Roger Spillman, Doug Byam, and there were always like the two big guys who were the university guys um, who kind of were the, were the role models for, uh, for us. And, and uh, we uh, worked here six days a week. We had one day off, that was I don't know when, but anyway, that's when you sort of ran home and made sure things were, I guess, to do laundry or something like that. But um, they had one bathroom in the house, three bedrooms, um, and then also the retail store on top. And, uh, and the amazing thing is like, uh, we learned here as a kid kind of thing, freshman, sophomore, junior, senior year of high school. Um, you made a lot of new friends, and also being from the other end of the lake, you learn more about this end of the lake, and then also the skills you picked up, like, uh, I, I, uh, I'm not mechanical, but Doug Byam was very mechanical. Al Bernard would take the mechanical people under and you had to repair motors and things like that. And then uh, I kind of learned, you know, like sanding, refinishing, painting, uh, rigging, storing boats, like, that boat up there, these were all divided into, there was like, you know, the, the class C's, E's, and you would rack them up, you would lift, the pulleys would lift the boat up, and that, you know, you'd have to take them down, and it was pre-fiberglass, which means everything was varnished, and you had to be sanded down and varnished, and, uh, and treat the hull right kind of thing. And uh, anyway, so he learned how to do that, and then also sailing. Uh, Harry had the Hell's Bells, which was a wonderful old Class A scow boat. And uh, he would take rides out from Murray's Inn, Lakeside, different places like that. <clears throat> and one of his great lines was, you know, like, get that jib line! You know, because if your jib was luffy or something like that, you would get a comment from Harry. <clears throat> the other thing was, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, the gizmo, which was an old lifeboat, and uh, there's some photographs of that that Jim Logie brought along, and we'll hear more about that later on. But the gizmo tours would, would also take people around the lake. Harry wanted to get people out in the lake, and it, the same thing, you know, like, you've got to get out on the water. I mean, it's right there. And uh, it, it, one of his comments in that article is that, you know, the local people here just assume that this lake is here and always, always going to be there. But, like, there are other people who are summer people who really spend, you know, that one, two, one week, one month, whatever, at the cottage. It's a big deal in their life cycle. So somehow we're, we're blessed to have White Lake, and we have to protect it. Um, also, you had to do dock duty because this is where they sold gas. Uh, you learned how to deal with the public. You had to work in the retail store up on the hill, and uh, just a, a, lo a lot of good, wonderful learning experiences. Um, I, I, I was telling friends on Mill Valley, right, lived it for 40 some years out in California about kind of what I was doing here and how we work at Skippers and you learned how to do this and um, um, 
you know, just kind of working and, and doing wonderful things and, and learning with the public and sailing and refinishing boats. And they turned, they had a son, Miller, who was kind of a problem kid, and, and they were sending him back east to school. And so they said, uh, well, how did your parents have to pay for that? And I said, hey, I mean, we, we worked, we got room and board, we got 50 cents an hour, you know. And uh, it really was a remarkable time. Um, the, the, the other uh, story, I, I, that, that somehow, um, I'm just kind of looking at my notes, we, we gained so much from, from just kind of the different experiences. We lived in the shack halfway up the hill. Al Bernard was a, a longtime worker here. Um, actually, George, he would lived in your house. They had your house before he moved into it. It's across the street from Leonard and Edna's house behind Jim Staples' house. Pat Rat house, as a matter of fact, yeah. Um, that was uh, Dr. Bernard's place. Anyway, um, every morning we'd be in the shack, and of course, when you're young, you don't want to get out of bed kind of thing, and, and, uh, and you've been out you know, raising hell the night before. And so you'd hear Al Bernard walking up the steps on these wooden steps, right? Clunk, 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 clunk. And then he would pound the side of the shack and say, Get out of bed, you lazy bastards! And, and that, that was our, our, our wake up call all the time from Al. And uh, another story which I hesitate to tell was, was that uh, there was a worker here and uh, sort of our age who was working and it was like nighttime and somehow you had to make sure the boats were secure and things like that. Harry standing on the dock, there were buoys on an anchorage, you know, off to the left there. And so um, he's yelling, you know, like, throw out the stern lines, throw out the stern lines, get that stern line. And so... <laughs> I was up here. Was, I was doing retail duty in the shop on top, right? You could hear, they had an intercom. You could hear all this noise going on down here, mumbling, jumbling, yelling, and shouting. I thought, my gosh, what's going on? And so um, um, all of a sudden, this um, unmentioned person walks up, and so I said, what was going on down there? And he said, I just got fired. I said, you got fired? What for? He said, Harry kept shouting, you know, throw out the stern line, get this, do that, do that, whatever. And he said, finally, I just said, oh, Harry, blow it out your blank. And he said, I forgot I was upwind. <laughs> and so the moral of that story is always remember that sound carries over the wind. Anyway, there's lots and lots of endless stories. And so I'm going to say, George, come on, you can tell some of yours. Come on up. Yeah, my story around here is from 55 to 60, and I sort of took up where Roger left off, because I think your last year, the next year was my first year. 49, 52. Okay, well, you wouldn't have been around for a right. couple right. of years. Right. But uh, one of my companions that I worked here for four years, Paul Bradfield, left his mark on this high beam, I see. Yeah. He was... Anyway, I, you know, I think Harry and Stell as... Roger noted what a great team. Harry, in my opinion, had sort of the vision of where he wanted to go, and Stella did all the work to get it there. <laughs> she was a remarkable person who could, uh, oh, cover up all of Harry's. Harry made some people unhappy. Yes. And <laughs> Stella could soothe it down, get it all taken care of, in between making the canvas for a boat, uh, cleaning a toilet, having a baby, all this stuff. She, she was, uh, again, a remarkable person. Uh, uh, just a comment about, oh, Harry, when this guy started right before World War II, uh, Harry then came home from the service, and Al Bernard has been helping Stell all through the war. And he came home from the service after keeping the Japs out of America, and uh, the way he told it, certainly <laughs> <laughs> correct. <laughs> and uh, and then he he started to build. He he got uh, you'll see the seawall out here. He bought all this um, oh uh, retaining wall and drove it in, which is still there today. Sheet piling. And, and the yacht club thought it was such a good idea. They had just extended it over to their property. But right, right after World War II, as, as Roger was noting, there was a, people had a lot of money and so on, and also banks to the middle class guy were willing to loan money for a boat, which they hadn't been before. So it was a great 
situation for somebody who was in a position like Harry and Stell were to take advantage of it. And uh, so it really grew, I'd say, through the 60s. He built, you know, number two and number three, and, and it sort of leveled up off. Uh, fiberglass boats didn't help. They didn't need to be refinished. So kids like me couldn't give somebody like uh, Mimi over here a buy and bottom on the, the bottom of her boat because you didn't need to do that to fiberglass boats. Uh, my favorite times here were probably out on the gas dock where uh, we were only the, the only gas dock on the end of the lake. You had to go all the way to Chalmers and Whitehall if you wanted gas. So he who rules the gas dock rules the lake. And we never let anybody forget it. We, uh, we had rumors that we'd start that if you do not tip the guy at the gas dock, that your boat will blow up right after you leave the boat. Uh, also, good-looking girls our age always get extra special service. Uh, their gas cans were clean before they were put back in, and then we were lifted. We lifted them down in the boat and put them. In the meantime, of course, getting where they were staying, what they were doing that night, and a number of other things. Uh, people who weren't nice to us on the gas dock. This this was all the six-gallon removal of a can. People who weren't nice to us on the gas dock would get their. Uh, gas tank thrown down to them in the boat and it would be covered with outboard oil. But, if, you know, a tip was coming, we could get down there with a rag and clean that baby really fast. <laughs> so, I, I could go on forever and I usually do about my six years at Skipper's Landing, which, like Roger, were the most, six most important educational years of my life, and I got two master's degrees. <laughs> and I learned more here in six years than I learned before or after. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah really, really was a wonderful. You know, the other thing that happened, like you already mentioned some of the social aspects, and that, like, uh, actually, one of the things that tonight, uh, Mary Lee Marie McGee was going to come and say something about how Stella basically would go to Murray's End, Lakeside Inn, Michelinda, and they would, uh, you know, sign up for uh, boat rides, boat tours, gizmo sailboat, misbehaving the old power boat, things like that. Just basically get the people out in the water, let them enjoy the water, sunset time, and things like that. Anyway, Mary Lee had to, she and Kim had to go to uh, a hospital thing too. Uh, everything's all right, but like some tests and stuff. Uh, in Chicago, so she couldn't be here tonight, but obviously she would have had some great Stella stories and how Stella kind of, you know, walked through. The other thing is that, like, the, the resorts were, like, 49 to 52 when I was here. They, they were still very much operating. During the 50s, you know, people started getting on jets and flying to Paris and doing this and doing that, and, and, uh, and so, you know, the time at the lake maybe became a little kind of less. And, uh, but what, what happened was that, like, you know, George knew, and I, I'll say we all knew, kids who worked in high school, primarily the girls who worked in high school, all right? And so, like, each resort had the slave quarters, the sh their shack, and so there'd be one at Michelinda, one at Murray's, one at uh, Lakeside, and, uh, and Illinois Villa, everybody knew somebody, and so there was like a great socialization process going on. Someone's always having a beach party, and I don't know, 99 bottles of beer in the wall, 99 bottles of beer, you know, just, just kind of dumb, innocent things, all pre-pill and stuff like that, but a uh, very interesting time. Um, I was thinking, you know, like, Lee Holly and Stocky have, were very, very good friends of Harry and Stella. You know, it, it's interesting, like, uh, Peter, who was directing traffic up on top, is like part of the Mason family. The Mason family on Lakeside Inn and all the way down the Yacht Club lands. Uh, Dan, you know, in, look, looking at the book, you'll you read all that, and that, uh, the golf course, and slow, slowly this was subdivided, and uh, it's amazing when you look at the old pictures how things have changed. Thank you for putting up with me and my slow motion. I have very little to say, except that to put this a little different perspective. Yeah, I got to put it up closer. Just hold, hold it closer to you. Like, like. Oh, is that better? You got to pretend you're a rock singer, you know. Yeah. Well, to put it a little differently, Harry started, I 
take a 2 by 12 or a 2 by 10 for his dock. You can just imagine that running out. If you can just imagine that and running out in front of the you and the sailboats coming in, even the A boat and so on. And uh, so it was a pretty rugged, difficult start. But Harry had a very strong belief in the people around here and the lake and the things that were offered. And I just want to give you some factual business on that. Harry uh, was a instructor in the third class of the sailing school, yeah. which was established in 1926. But Harry started teaching in 1928, and he continued for an additional years to 1933. And many of the people, perhaps tonight, remember him as the fellow that sat down here on this little old dock and waved at him and you came up and he had a boat here for you to learn from. And so this goes on and on and Harry was a staunch supporter of White Lake. And over the years there have been a whole number of people who have been through his teaching. And the teaching is just the personal part of his existence here. And the uh, marinas represent what he did to control all the west of us crazy people who when we want to get out on the water. And I have nothing more to say. Okay. <laughs> okay. Thank you. I'd also like to say Lee, Lee Holly was one of the you know sailing school instructors of the yacht club. And um, the other thing that you know, like one of the when you worked down here, one of the required readings was you had to read the, like the Yonquist version of the White Lake Yacht Club Sailing School thing. And um, you just could have read that and, and just learned about you know more about sailing and. Uh, Anyway, Lee was one of the original. Yeah. Dandy, would you like to say something historically? Come on up and say something. Dan, Dan, we are very lucky to have Dan here, because, and also Jean, who's a very protective wife, so Dan can write, all right? And he's, yeah. he's written about looking at uh, history of White Lake Yacht and tourism of White Lake, uh, the land between Sylvan Beach, uh, Logging the White, uh, more recently, the Doctor one. You can sit down or whatever you like to tell. More about more than about doctors. My son was a sailing school instructor. Uh, we aren't from around here, so I never learned about any boats until I got over here. When we went fishing, it was with a bent pin and a worm. So that's all I know. Well, I, I have I don't I didn't know Harry well. Uh, Roger and I interviewed him to write looking at, but. Uh, uh, other than, and I met him a few other times, but uh, I have read what he's written, so I thought I'd share a story that he wrote for White Lake Yacht Club News back you know, many years ago. This was when he was he started his sailing when he was 15 years old, still in high school, and uh, he and his father and Jack Garrett, who was the sailing school instructor at that time, the first one, uh, went to uh, Lake Geneva back in 1927 and they were looking for an A-boat. Times were so tough and uh, this was a gaff rigged boat uh, and everybody else was converting to Marconi rig. So they bought this boat for the cost of the um, storage, $80. Sold it later on for $225. So he was a pretty good <laughs> dealer in, in boats, I would have to say. And then the, the story is how they brought it back from Lake Geneva. They brought it back to Chicago, stayed overnight. And the, the, this is a big boat. I mean, if you don't know an A-boat, it's a 38-footer. And, and then the mast sticks off the back. 
So they brought it back over two days, finally up to White Lake. And uh, in the meantime, they got a, a citation in some little town in southern Michigan for something. It was so big, they had to basically go down the middle of the road. They couldn't just hug the one side. Of, this would be four expressways. So they're just two lane roads. And they twisted and turned and made sharp corners and so forth because they, they weren't modern roads anymore. On one occasion, they had to they stop quickly, and the Model T forward, Ford that was following them ran right into the mast, destroyed its uh, front end. So there were all kinds of adventures as they were coming back. But that they raced that boat for a while, but never won with it because they had to compete with these newer boats. They were still wooden, but they had a gaff rig, and then the newer boats had a spinnaker, while the black bottom, they called it, had only a jib. So they really couldn't go very fast. He was a good sailor, but of course you, you start out in a bad boat. That's the advice I always gave my son, start on a bad boat. You're gonna lose anyway, so you can always blame it on the boat. And then as you get better, you get a better boat, and then you feel better about yourself. So uh, that's what Harry did. He had this fleet of boats. The black bottom was called that because they painted the bottom with graphite, thinking it would make it be a little more slick as it waddled through the water. Uh, it didn't help a lot. Later on they renamed it the uh, Copper King or something like that. And then they had Hell's Bells, that was a later boat. And many, many others. The only other story I know about Harry is one he told us when we were interviewing him. And it had to do with uh, Skipper's Three, which is now Whitehall Landing. He bought that, and it's right next to the tannery property, as you know, which is now no longer a tannery. And uh, he had a, a bitter hatred for the tannery. It goes back many years. He, he'd talk about the stench coming from the tannery and how terrible it was. And he could really go on. So he had a bitter hatred. But when he bought Skipper's Three, he discovered that the railroad spur that went into the tannery crossed over his property. And the previous owner had not paid any attention to it. He wanted to be a good doobie and just let the tannery use that property. But Harry refused to have that happen, so he met with their attorney, and every time they offered some money, his price kept going up and up and up. He never would allow them to cross his property with the railroad track. So eventually they had to relent, and they started bringing everything in by, by truck and shipping out. But that, that, I think you can still see where that, that uh, spur goes off, but uh, they could no longer use it. That's the best I can do. Okay, Mark. Mark. Question before you go. Could you talk a little bit about Stella? Me? <laughs> well, I, I can talk. We, we interviewed both of them, but having interviewed other people, uh, there's a basic rule, you never in, uh, interview a couple at the same time. And that, that goes triple with Harry and Stella. <laughs> because they would have different stories. And when that ha and again, I can't say that this happened with them because we didn't interview them together, but typically that you start talking to the one and they tell you their version of the truth. And then the other one says, well, that isn't the way it was at all, you know. It was Tuesday, not Thursday. Now, they didn't do that with us, but that was what we feared. And that's the only story I know, and it really doesn't deal with her. Actually, I... I... Okay, Lila, why don't you come up and say something about Stella? This is Lila, uh, and, and Terry's mother, and um, uh, Lila, there's a picture of Lila, have Lila in bondage. We tied her to the Riyadh Club rail over there. And uh, <laughs> anyway, Lila was one of the girls that uh, helped. And so, anyway, you know. Here I'm very happy that Roger let me know about this tonight because I have a lot of really fond memories. <clears throat> and as George talked about the education we got, I came here to live when I was 13 and lived six months out of the year in the house that doesn't, it didn't look like this, but it was up there. And uh, from 13 to 15, or to 18, excuse me, until I graduated from high school. <clears throat> and uh, we, my version of Stella and the impact she made on my life, 
you have to remember, we're talking about a 13 to 18 year old in the 50s. Now all of you women here know what we were required. We were either going to have to be a teacher, a housewife, or an airline stewardess. That, that was our goal. I had the privilege of being living with and being taught by one of the most progressive women I could possibly have known in those years of my life because she ran the boathouse while Harry was in the, in, in the war as has been stipulated here earlier. But, uh, and she was very much the backbone of many, many things that happened here. As you've also gathered from the information, Harry was an absolute bear. But I was off limits to him altogether. Stella protected me all of those years. He never gave me a tongue lashing because she wouldn't allow it. <laughs> and that doesn't mean I probably didn't deserve it at times. But I know that I also made him very nervous because uh, Stella let me drive their New Yorker Chrysler into town and buy groceries. That was, Harry was petrified. He was sure I was gonna wreck it every time I did that. Um, I used to take the weather on the radio. You guys will remember that. He had a fit every day that I was gonna mess up the weather. It was a little radio and you had three numbers that told you the direction and the wind and what else, Roger? I, I don't remember. But anyway, three, three numbers and every day, he, it had to be at noon and every day he was sure that I wouldn't get it right. <laughs> and that tells you a little bit about Harry. But Stella was a very remarkable woman and as I said, the education I got from her has been with me all of these years. I've probably done a lot of things in my life that were ahead of the game for women, and I'm sure that it's because of that training that came from with Stella. We, I stayed through into the fall and went to school from here, and the, the Harry would take off hunting and various things, and so that's when uh, Stella and I just wrecked havoc with either, everything we could get our hands on. We tiled that whole house one year while he was gone, um, we would get so busy that we'd forget to take out anything to eat. So I was afraid of the saws, so Stella would have to come down and get the meat out of the freezer and cut the hamburger patties on the bandsaw, then I'd cook them. But I, <laughs> true story, it was right back in that corner someplace. Um, I don't know, what, what Roger, those okay. kind of the highlights? Of, yeah. Okay. Yeah. There are lots and lots of stories, but it, it was it was a real experience, and that training has withstood me my whole life, I'm sure. Thank you, Lila. Hey, another, another story would be, be that, um, you know, Harry was kind of, Harry was very loud and, and uh, boisterous, let's say, whatever. Uh, but anyway, like, if he had trouble with the clients and how that would happen down here, Stella would be in the retail shop on the hill, meet the guy, greet the guy, you know, before he got in the car and drove away and somehow calm the waters kind of thing. When Lila mentioned, like, he didn't want you driving the car because you might wreck it, <laughs> one night, the game was that, so Roger Spielman and I, uh, um, Harry had a wonderful Chrysler air flip. Today would be a collector's item. Very, very deco, modern kind of looking. And so, uh, Roger and I, we drove into town because you had to go see what's going on in town, right? We came around the corner by the Taggart House, which actually George has now, and uh, the Blue House across the street. And he came, we came around the corner, and as we came around the corner, this tree thing just fell in front of us. And it was one of these, the curse of this location is the northwest wind. And so to get those stern lines, I mean, you have to really, the waves just smash in here. And so it was one of those nights when everything was happening. So we just left the car on the road kind of thing. We came down here and had to deal with it. And obviously, we, we did crash up the Chrysler airflow. So he had a background on worried about that. Okay, what else? Uh, I'm Jerry Rowe. I worked here 69, 70, summers of 69, 70. Uh, of course, Harry was a crusty old salt, a PT boat captain of the PT 192. No. No. He later had a boat he called the Martini 192. And you can imagine what that meant. So I'm on gas dock duty one night. Of course, Harry would come down here every night from their house and sit and have a couple of toonies, as they called them. And I saw this boat around the corner of the channel, 
and head straight for the dock. And I figured, well, he's coming for gas, and of course he was. And I met him down there, tied him off, and started pumping gas. Well, Harry comes strolling out in the dock, the way Harry always did. He was an acquired taste for a lot of people. You either loved him or you didn't. And he walks up and he sees this brand new houseboat. And he says to the guy, this guy was the wife of two kids, pretty nice boat you got here. I said, oh yeah, we're real happy with it. We've had a really good time with it. Harry said, well, where'd you happen to pick this up? He says, uh, well, we got it down there on Henry Street, Bob Moore's. Harry pulled out his knife, cut both lines, pushed the boat off the dock, and said, Jerry, turn off the gas pumps. <laughs> True story. True story. <laughs> and Stella Pellinger was an angel. Harry was probably one of the luckiest men on there. Thank you. Well, like George, I'm a stick to your veteran of the Pellinger School of Marketing and Operation. <laughs> I, uh, I started my career following Rogers group. I got here in 53. And um, I was 15, here years, right. if, if, I was 15 yeah. years old, and on the first day, I stepped on a board that had a nail sticking up and right through my foot. And of course, they roared me into Doc Angstrom, and he looked it over, <laughs> poured some cure chrome in it, took a stitch, and said, Wear shoes. <laughs> True story. Uh, the thing I like the best about Harry, even as a kid, and especially as an adult when I was with him, he would never ask you to do anything he wouldn't do with you. And he could probably do it better than you did. But you learned. And we've all heard about his temper. I mean, that was, he was a legend, you know, even before I knew him. He never changed. Although, I was fortunate enough to see him the summer before he passed. He and I share August as a birth month. So for years, we would have a birthday party together, a week apart. And uh, I remember Barbara and I stopped to see him at his house on Michelin Road. That last year he was with us. and. Uh, we had a great visit, and uh, it was very frail, but the spark was still there. And uh, I said to him, I said, listen, old man, I said, uh, I want you to stick around, because I'm coming up next year, uh, and I want to have a birthday party. And he kind of looked at me, and he said, Jimmy, I'll do my best. And of course, we lost him that next April. Uh, but, uh, oh, Give you an idea. He used to go to Florida in the winter, and the first year that I came to work, came back to work with him as an adult, I got here in about the middle of February, and about two weeks later, he said, "Well, it's your place. I'm going to Florida," and away he went. You know, here I'm back in Michigan for two weeks, and I'm running a marina. We didn't have number three yet, and. Uh, one day I was in the Muskegon Bank and Trust. We had our floor plan there and uh, for our boats and our motors. And uh, they had just changed bank managers at the Whitehall branch. Uh, a young fellow by the name of Odell was the new manager. And he comes, he sees me come in the bank and he says, uh, can I see you a minute? And I said, yeah. He said, I've just gotten this directive from the downtown bank that we're going to get out of the floor plan business and we would like you to pay up your floor plan. I said, well, I said, uh, Mr. Pillinger's out of town, but I said, he calls me every Friday. I said, I'll, uh, I'll let him know and, and we'll get back to you. Now, sure enough, about five o'clock, just about dinner time is when he would call, get the bank balance, and did you sell anything? And, what have you. And uh, I said, I told him about what the bank manager had said to me, and he kind of chuckled, and he said, well, Jimmy, except for my own family, he's the only, he and Stella were the only ones that ever called me Jimmy. He said, you want to learn this business? He said, I'll tell you what you do. He said, you make, he said, I can do this. 
I have funds available, private funds, and I can take out the floor plan. I don't want to because when we get back, I've got some plans that are gonna, I'm gonna need that money for, and you're gonna be involved. But he said, I want you to make the call on this one. And he said, whatever you do, I'll back you. Okay, boss. So I thought about it, and I went into the files, and I read the floor plan agreement. The next day I was in the bank, nine o'clock, when they opened up, and I said, uh, Mr. O'Dell, I said, uh, talked to Mr. Billinger last Friday evening, and <clears throat> he says, it's my call. So I said, where do you want me to deliver your boats and motors? <laughs> and I thought Mr. O'Dell was going to fall right out of his chair. He said, what do you mean? I said, well, I said, I've checked my bank balance, and I don't have enough money to take up take out this floor plan. And so I talked to Mr. Billinger, and he said, Hey, you make the call. I said, I'm making the call. Where do you want your boats and motors? He said, well, I'm going to have to call downtown. I said, well, why don't you go ahead and do that? i got a thing to do. I'm going back to the store. And uh, that's when I was working the store down in Montague because this marina was closed. Uh, you know, it was still snow on the ground. And uh, about an hour later, I get a call from the bank president, Dick Morgenstern. I said, just see by the paper, he passed away here recently. I knew Dick and I liked him. He's laughing. and he said, boy, have you ruined Mr. O'Dell's day. <laughs> he said, I'll bet you, you read your floor plan agreement. I said, sure did, Dick. He said, Mr. O'Dell didn't. <laughs> and he said, so you don't have to worry about paying off your floor plan. As long as you make your payments the way you're supposed to, you're good to go. He said, maybe next year, you know, we'll have a different plan. But right now, you're good. So, you know, Harry calls the next next uh, Friday night. And he said, well, how'd you make out with the bank? I told him. He said, well, I told Mr. O'Dell, the new manager there, that uh, I wanted to know where to deliver his boats and his motors. And he said, you didn't. I said, yes, I did. Well, what did he say? He didn't say anything. He was in shock when I left the building. But he said, I got a call from the bank president. We don't have to worry about it. They're not calling, they're not calling that note. But uh, I learned a lot from both of them. Uh, uh, I got hollered at, fired, rehired, just like everybody that ever worked for him. There's <laughs> one person who ever worked for that man that didn't get fired at least once. And maybe twice. But he didn't really mean it. Because, you know, the world changed when Roger and our group worked here. We lived here, we ate here, he paid us. My first year here, I got here right after high school, got out in June. I stayed until Labor Day, 250 bucks for the whole season. Now how do you live on, and, and you don't get any money till the end of the summer. So how do, you, how do you live? Well, back in those days, over the club, they had parties on Saturday night and they sold beer to the members and they had a beer table out on the back porch. And me and one of the other guys got hired to be there to hand out beers to Dr. Holly or the Gillens when they came. I mean, uh, I'm, I've met people up back in the 50s that are still my friends. And, uh, but they'd give you chips. They didn't, we didn't handle any money, but we got tips. And I could pick up four, six, seven dollars a night in 1953 dollars every Saturday night. It was wonderful. I made more money at the club than I made here. But that was okay. Harry didn't care. As long as we had hit the firing line, put in our 12 hour day, everything was cool. Right. You know, it was a wonderful experience. I mean, I think George really said it. The things that he learned from Harry and Stella were better than a 
college degree by a lot. And I say that today with a smile on my face because as, as many fights I had that that man, I loved him like a family member, and I loved Stella like a mom. The story I, I always thinking of was that Hooker was fined for doing some lake pollution or something like that. The fund, the money then was deposited with the state of Michigan, and Michigan somehow, it was for maybe marina development. And so Harry's point of view was something like, you know, well look, that, that is White Lake money, it came from Hooker, it's going to be spent here in White Lake, and we're going to spend it and improve the Whitehall Marina. Is that a true story, Dad? Because what he was concerned was that somehow if it went to the state, that somehow, you know, the marina money would go to build, let's say, a marina in Bay City or Saginaw. And to hell with that, we're going to take that White Lake money and spend it on White Lake. That'd be a hairy attitude. Hi, my name is Andy Holly. I live next door, and I grew up here. Actually, not here. I grew up next door at the White Lake Yacht Club. That was in uh, the 1963 to a few years later. Uh, I was a 10-year-old coming down to the Yacht Club for the first time. There was a board that went across the swamp on cement bricks. And I can't tell you how many times I got halfway across and I was too scared to progress. Because to me, Harry was a modern day pirate. <laughs> you could hear him shouting and taking his team to task. And, and then there was his team. They were all big, burly guys to a little 10 year old. And it was just an intimidating place to come. Uh, but then when that same 10-year-old, in a, in a rush to provide livery service to the e-boat skippers who were moored out at a White Lake, uh, or a, rather a Western Michigan Yachting Association regatta, did what his father told him never to do, which was try to put the motor on at the dock and dropped it to the bottom of White Lake. <laughs> <laughs> These guys were Johnny on the spot to come over helped me fish that thing out and got me going within the next couple of hours. And of course then there was the retail store. Now I got to the retail store by going all the way up the Yacht Club stairs and around because again, it was too dangerous for a 10 year old to come through the lower part of the marina. But up top, that's where Stella was. That was, was her place. And um, as they were backing down the boat business, they still had every piece of imaginable hardware that a young butterfly skipper could need. And there are things on those butterflies today which are standard gear that were invented by yacht, yacht club skippers supplied by Stella Pillinger and all the various hardware parts. Like the boom van. There was never a boom van on a, a a butterfly until they started appearing at White Lake Captain, thanks in part to the, the Pillagers. Several years later, I had the opportunity to go down uh, one winter to uh, Florida with my dad, with, with Joe Marvel, and uh, we chartered a boat and went out uh, after one, I can remember, memorable dinner at the Pillagers where we peeled shrimp. Uh, till we were so stuffed we, we didn't think we'd make it to the boat in the morning, but we did. It was an overnight trip. We uh, anchored out there, ostensibly fishing for grouper. And I had already called it a night. I was in the cot. It had been a long day fishing with the gang. And I think Dad and Harry were still up. Joe may have already hit the rack too. And all of a sudden I hear screaming and a big commotion out back a big group of amberjack had come through and taken one of the last lines in the water and we were in the midst of a fight, a Chinese fire drill as this thing tried to get its, the line down around the prop. And Dan was out there and Harry were out there with mops trying to keep the line off the, off the bottom of the boat. Uh, and I came through that experience to really appreciate uh, who Harry really was not the persona that he, he put on for, uh, for clients, for the work team,
and for little 10 year olds, too timid to make it more than halfway across the, the wooden dock. Okay. Thank you, Andy. I was thinking one more Harry story, like, okay, we had rentals, and so then there were sailboats out there, and also he rented speedboats, powerboats. And so uh, there was a guy that came through, wanted to rent a, a Chris Craft, and uh, probably about an 18 foot or something like that, which Harry had. He was always taking things in trade, out of trade, that sort of thing. And so uh, he warned the guy, you know, like, you know, probably don't go out in Lake Michigan, and if you do get out there, you know, like, don't sit up on the edge, because obviously, you know, you're always sitting down like this, the bow is up there, and you want to, so you want to sit on the side and, and steer and see what's going on, right? So we're, we're doing our little night duty here and, and uh, what's going on kind of thing. And uh, Harry gets a phone call from somebody over on the Lake Michigan side of Sylvan saying there is a Chris Craft speedboat going around in circles out in Lake Michigan with no one in it. And we think that you ought to, it might be one of your boats and you ought to do something about that. And so uh, Harry and I get, Harry loved to tell this story. We get in the gizmo, right, which is the old life lifeboat saving boat kind of thing and we go chugging out the channel and sure enough you know there's I don't know where the guy is I guess the guy ended up on shore somewhere <clears throat> he was he wasn't harmed but anyway the boat is just bouncing around the waves going around in a circle and so it, the gizmo was kind of like a slug and so you couldn't really catch up with it and you had to jump from one to the next and so what are we going to do? So there was lots of line in, in, in the gizmo. And so we decided what we would do is we would try to run across the front of the power boat, the Chris Craft, throw in some lines, and ultimately kind of try to follow the prop so the boat would ultimately stop. And, uh, and so we kept doing it. It must have taken about a half an hour, 45 minutes. Boom, 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 this sort of thing. And then ultimately, we did follow the prop ended up towing it back in. I have no idea how Harry dealt with that guy <laughs> after that, but I'm sure it was rather vocal. Um, um, my name's Dick Marvel, and I actually was born in Muskegon because my family never missed a summer up here. That was 78 years ago, so I started sailing when I was 12 and bought a nipper from the pillagers. So we go way back. And in the 50s, my dad fortunately had a Lyman with a 25 horsepower motor on it, which was capable of skiing. And there were very few skiers uh, on White Lake at that time. One of the <laughs> and John Truxell and I went around to these various resorts, got in bed, so to speak, with the lifeguards. They made uh, referrals so we could take people water skiing and we guaranteed to get everybody up or their, their money back. Well at the same time those people were renting boats from Harry and all of a sudden Harry's rentals went down and Harry uh, did not like to lose revenue <laughs> so he found out what was going on. He went to uh, Murray's Inn and said uh, why aren't you renting boats? Well, these guys are giving us ski lessons, and uh, you rent us this Lumacraft with 15 horsepower. We can't get up. These guys guarantee it, and are we get their money back? So we had a pretty good thing going, and my dad didn't know we were doing this. And uh, <clears throat> of course, so Harry also made uh, some money selling life insurance, and he knew all about risk, etc. So we were pulling over here to fill up our uh, tanks at the wonderful gas dock, which was controlled, of course. And we're filling up, and all of a sudden I hear this boom from up above, and it's Harry. <laughs> Dickie! Dickie, I want to talk to you! And he's running down the stairs. He comes to the gas dock and he said, I understand you're ready and giving lessons. And I said, yes. And he said, uh, does your dad know you're doing that? And I said, no. He said, do you know what the liability of that is? And I turned to Truxell and I said, we're out of business. <laughs> and he said, if you stop it, I won't tell him. And I said, you got a deal, Harry, and we're out of business. <laughs> but I, I and a lot of people nominated Stella for sainthood a yeah. long, long time ago. We wished it would have happened. Yeah.
how much did your parents have to pay to you know, keep you down here during the summer kind of thing on a job. And uh, the other thing that Harry did was he was a Northwestern Mutual Insurance life salesman, all right? How many here bought a Pillinger life saving policy? Because I, I see Lila raising her hand. My parents did that, and I didn't know if that was one of the trade offs for getting the kid out of the house during the summer or not. But anyway, uh, we all had Northwestern Mutual life insurance policies. Um, hey, there's refreshments over there. Anybody else have anything to say? Um, Lowe, do you have anything to say? It was a great time. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, I, I, I think you see Lowe's x ran and you think, that was the vagabond. And, uh, and then there was another one, uh, things you had a sand and paint kind of thing, like um, Mr. Dinette up there where Duck Kniff lives had a boat called the Puffin, and you had to work on that. And uh, what would happen is that, you know, you would have a... Um, in, an e-boat, which is, you know, like 28 feet of, 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 you know, fine woodwork kind of thing. And those windows there, they, they were, the trees weren't there and the sun would come in, all right? And so you would sand by hand, you would then varnish, they would be tipped upside down, and then Harry would come in. He was wonderful because basically he'd stand here and he'd look at the edge like this, right? And you had to get a lot of varnish and a lot of paint if you wanted to fill up all the whatever, whatever, cracks or whatever. And so he'd look and say, get those damn runs, you know, meaning that the varnish had run down the hall. And you had, he'd take the, take the brush out of your hand, and he'd pull all the varnish out, and, and you, you learned how to do it right. You know, we, well, this building, uh, great, the first building, the first building was lower than this building, going towards the lake, all right? And if you walk on the dock sometime, take a look back, you'll see the original steel piling, sheet piling edge. And there's another, about that, you know, three feet of concrete. That was all filled. And so, like, when the high water came up, this building was dry, but you'd walk down into the lower building. All of the level here, the yacht club, etc., was all raised at least three feet. And as we all know, the yacht club started out as a boathouse. And, uh, and you, uh, I, you know, the ice and damage and things like that were, were really uh, quite, quite fatal. Uh, but anyway, a constant struggle against high water, low water, dock up, dock down, that sort of thing. Um, let's see, any other comments? Okay, uh, the, the one thing is, why don't we turn the lights on? I, I, I would, okay. We can't turn the lights on because the lights don't work, all right? So we are now going to be shadows. Somebody was pointing to somebody else who was going to say something? Yes, Marilyn. Oh, thank God. Why are you serious? Okay, come on up. Marilyn Brown, she was, uh, along with Lila, uh, part of one of the workers. Uh, yes, I was here to take care of Mike, and Mike was three and I was 12. And so we were really here to have fun. And so one day we were up in the uh, storage where Stella was, and Mike decided that we could shake pop. And I said, that sounds good to me. And so we got the pop machine and uh, I don't know how Mike got the money, but he got the money, and uh, we took every bottle of pop that we could get a hold of, you know, we put the money in, and we'd shake it up, and it'd spray all over the cars, and I don't know if any of you got your car sprayed in bed with Mike and my mom, or pop, but I think it was Coke that went the furthest. If we just shook that out, it really went all over. And, um, uh, it didn't end bad. I mean, we just somebody came home and said we shouldn't be doing that. So that's how that ended. Uh, another experience we had was um, I put Mike to bed real early one night. I was uh, planning on doing something else, probably with some guys or something. I don't know. And we're watching what they were doing. And um, I put Mike to bed, and uh, I took off. And pretty soon I went back to check on him, and he wasn't in bed. He was gone. And so I got a hold of Roger, Roger Sh uh, Skillman, and they started looking for him. I can't remember where, did, I can't know, where, I don't know where he went. But anyway, we did find him, but it was really a scary, scary uh, time for a while there, not knowing where Mike had taken off for. And um, so then I stayed with him. I didn't uh, leave the room, I didn't leave his bed, and I stayed right there. Um, I did have a, a bed in with Mike. Upstairs in one of those uh, rooms there. Um, another thing that um, Mike did was he went out to the furthest part of that dock out there and he jumped in and I couldn't swim. Mike was taking swimming lessons from Dolly Morton 
And uh, Annie was taking lessons. Annie came over and played with Mike a lot. We worked together a lot. And uh, I just yelled that Mike fell in. And uh, one of you guys went got him. Did you get him? I wonder if it was. Yeah, yeah, I, I know that was. So uh, I wasn't allowed to let him out on that part anymore. You know, I had to keep him up you know, here. So but that was my fun times I had down here. And Hollinger uh, lived next door to me in Whitehall. So uh, I've known Mike forever. Now he lives in town on Elliott Street. So I see him once in a while, not too often. But uh, I've known Mike since he was, you know, really young. So thank you. Yeah, there was a very close relationship. Obviously, you know, the yacht club had the races. Wooden boats, wooden boats need to be stirred. As we mentioned earlier, I think that's how we, they racked these things. All there were racks all through here, block and tackle, block and tackle. You had to lift them up and lower them down. And then if they need to be refinished, you had to refinish them. This this place was just totally stacked with with the uh, Wi Fiers, E's, C's, that sort of thing. And then fiberglass came along. Yeah, Dick can tell you all about that. <laughs> okay, I, I think we, uh, there's refreshments over here, and um, as I said, we can't turn the lights on, so. <laughs>